and gentlemen, please welcome to the podium the sponsor of this session, Suzelle DeVette, Associate Director from Turner and Townsend. Good morning, everyone. Turner and Townsend is pleased to be sponsoring this breakout session, Social Procurement Pipeline and Managing Public Assets, at the 25th CP or C2 P3 conference. Turner and Townsend has been partnering in delivering social infrastructure P3 projects across North America since 2004, the first of our project being the Brampton Civic Hospital. We are pleased to witness the continued growth and diversity of the social infrastructure market, championed by John McKendrick and his team at Infrastructure Ontario. Today, Infrastructure Ontario will update the market on its social procurement pipeline which will be funnel, followed by a panel discussion of best practices in managing public assets, including government's real property. Our moderator is John McKendrick, Executive Vice President, Social Infrastructure Ontario. John McKendrick has been with Infrastructure Ontario since its inception in November 2005, having been an integral part of major projects divisions from the outset. He has had the unique opportunity to participate in and drive the evolution of the program. As the Executive Vice President, Project Delivery Social, John is responsible for the planning, development, and procurement of major public infrastructure projects. His portfolios include, or his portfolio includes hospitals, colleges, courthouses, a data center, and the Pan Am Games infrastructure projects. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming John McKendrick. Thank you very much, Suzelle, and thank you to Turner and Townsend. Uh, Turner and Townsend uh, for sponsoring this event. Turner and Townsend is a big participant in our program, providing a lot of uh, quantity surveying services uh, for our program, and so uh, we appreciate do a lot of work with them. Um, I just want to make a few introductory remarks and then I will introduce our uh, panelists. Um, uh, just a few things to say about the social procurement pipeline without giving away too much detail. It's going to be released uh, later today. You'll probably hear the Premier talk about it next, so I recommend you go and, and listen to that. Uh, last year's project pipeline focused on transit and transportation projects as a priority of the government. Uh, this year's pipeline will demonstrate more of a balance between the social or building projects, which I focus on, and the civil projects, for, which are the transit and the roads. Um, some of the projects on the pipeline were previously announced by the government in other, uh, other um, forms. Uh, for example, uh, you know, we've announced three new justice projects. There's a new courthouse in Oakville, the Halton Region Courthouse. There are two new de detention centers, the uh, Ottawa Detention Center and the Thunder Bay Detention Center. There were five health care projects announced in the budget, um, one in Hamilton, one in Niagara, uh, one in Mississauga, the Trillium Hospital, uh, the Weenie-Bako Area Health Authority Hospital, which is in Moosonee and Moose Factory, which is very much with the... Um, uh, the start of the conference focusing on uh, uh, First Nations uh, needs that need to be addressed, and then the Windsor Regional Health Center. So those, we don't, you don't have a lot of details on them yet. There will be more details released today. Um, and there are going to be more new projects announced in the pipeline today, but you'll, again, you'll just have to wait a bit of a teaser there. Um, we've also, they're going to talk about previ previously announced Regional Express Rail uh, civil projects, uh, we've got the Queen's Park a reconstruction project out there involving the redevelopment of the McDonald Block, which uh, is going to be a design, build, finance, maintain uh, project. This is going to be certainly an ambitious and diverse project pipeline, and we're moving ahead on these commitments. In fact, those of you who watch the market closely will see the indicators of the progress that is being made, for example. The, uh, the program design and compliance architect for the Halton Courthouse has already been hired. Um, and the, uh, the, uh, the request for proposals for the program design and compliance architects for the two detention centers is out in the market right now. In fact, it may even have closed. Um, the Premier will have further particulars, so listen in for what she has to say. And once you've had an opportunity to study the pipeline, um, 
then, uh, then you'll realize that what we're going to talk about today is, uh, is very topical. Whenever you talk about social projects, and uh, particularly when they are design, build, finance, maintain, you know, one of the big things that we face is, okay, that's great, we built them now. Now we have to maintain them, we have to operate them, and, and there are often a lot of challenges as you move from the construction, completion of the project into the uh, maintenance aspect of the project. And we're got, we've got a, quite a good panel here today to talk about that. So the first person I'm going to introduce here uh, is uh, Sean Wiley. He's the Executive Vice President of uh, Asset Management and Realty Operations and my colleague at Infrastructure Ontario. In a few minutes, he'll talk more about um, his specific role. Then we have John Fleming from Johnson Controls. John is, uh, is the uh, Vice President and General Manager of uh, P3 Infrastructure. And then finally, we have James Paul, who is the President and CEO of Defence Construction Canada. So starting with Sean, I'm going to give each of them two to three minutes to talk about their specific roles in their organization. Then we'll get in for, into the questions and uh, have a bit of a dialogue. And then there will be time at the end for questions from the audience as well. They've already started coming up on the panel, so keep, uh, keep uh, sending those questions in. All right, Sean, thank, over to you. Thank you, John. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as John mentioned, my name is Sean Wiley. I'm uh, the EVP responsible for realty operations and asset management of the uh, general real estate portfolio uh, in Infrastructure Ontario. Uh, the general real estate portfolio in Infrastructure Ontario includes uh, over 45 million uh, rentable square feet, over a million acres of land, and uh, over 5,000 buildings and structures that we're overall responsible for. And within that number of 5,000, we actually have 10 AFP or P3 projects in the operations phase, and, and that falls into my area of responsibility as well. In the session we just uh, we came out of, there was, a, there was some talk in there about uh, commitment and, and managing the contracts through the life of, of these, of these uh, projects. And um, one of the reasons I was brought on in Infrastructure Ontario was initially to, to focus directly just on AFP projects, working with my colleague uh, Bill Hebburn and his team. And really that was a commitment made by Infrastructure Ontario and I think an investment by Infrastructure Ontario to making sure the projects are managed and aren't just, as was mentioned earlier this morning, just put into, uh, on a shelf or, or, or in a filing cabinet and, and to be managed on their own. Uh, Infrastructure Ontario, you know, through, through, uh, through Bert Clark and Aaron Corey and, and Marnie Dicker and my boss Tony Rossi made that commitment because they recognized, you know, we're at a critical mass in DBFM projects, they need attention in the operations phase. So that's why they, they you know, made, made that commitment to, 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 to investing in, in my team. It was, it was either that element of, of the commitment or they recognized that John needed help in commissioning the projects uh, and, uh, to come across. Ooh, that hurt, Sean. <laughs> but either way, they recognized there was a need there and I'm happy to be here. Okay, thanks, Sean. And then John, over to you. Thank you and good morning, everybody. I guess today I got two roles, maybe. Uh, first of all, Charles Controls plays the M in the DBFM, so call a service co, maintenance, it's a lot of different names, uh, I guess over the years that we call us. And I think, uh, I guess being the only one up here from the private sector, maybe I'll uh, take on a different hat when the appropriate time we'll comes nice. as well. We're gonna take yeah. some shots at <laughs> you. We're gonna take some shots at you guys. Um, I, I think as for Charles Controls, for those who don't know, we, we've been basically bidding a P3 projects since they started in Canada. Uh, Abbotsford Hospital, as we speak about operations, is in its 10th year. That was our first project out in uh, British Columbia. And since that time, we've managed to accumulate 32 projects overall. And I think we just have our 22nd one you know, going to the operational phase. So quite a bit of experience, um, very good market share in the space. We continue to, to look forward, not just here. Um, an interesting note for those maybe work south of the border like I do as well, for the first time, our U.S. pipeline is equal to our Canadian pipeline uh, for FY18, which is the start of our fiscal year here in October, or last month. So it's interesting that we're seeing some of the ties today, and I know there's going to be some discussions about uh, Canadian company, Canadian talent taking advantage of, of that opportunity. And I guess uh, the last thing I would just say about, um, you know, from the operational side is that it's important to think of these contracts you know, not just the day we sign them, but what it's going to look like in 30 years from now when we hand them back. Thank okay, you. thank you, John. Uh, James, over to you. 
So Defense Construction Canada is a federal crown corp that delivers the infrastructure and environment program for Canada's defense needs. Um, defense is our customer. I, I, we report to Parliament through the Minister of Public Services and Procurement, the Honourable Carla Qualtro. Uh, D&D is the largest real property holder in the federal government universe, uh, over 25 billion realty replacement cost. We do more than 2,000 infrastructure projects delivered annually, billion plus in expenditures. And, and what's unique about the defense side and probably you know, was part of why we were created over 65 years ago by Parliament is the sophisticated and complex nature of defense infrastructure. So it tends to be 24 by 7 critical mission operational type facilities. Nowadays, high security requirement, remote aspects in the north. We also support all the global um, deployments, uh, Afghanistan, current conflicts. We have staff in Erbil, Kuwait, Latvia, wh wherever the Canadian military needs infrastructure and environmental support. So, so that's, that's really our mandate. Now, our interest in P3s is we've delivered two large federal P3s um, that have been very successful to date. Uh, well, I say, so the first one's in its third year of operating. It's the Communications Security Establishment Headquarters facility. I'm gonna talk about that a bit later in the IT section, but it's a TS facility, top secret, um, with, with very sophisticated data requirements. We've, we're also just completing the Shared Services Canada Data Center in Borden. And, and I can't announce any new projects, but I can tell you, we, well, we've done a market sound on another one coming up. I'm talking about P3s here. And, uh, and also, there's probably more than a handful in the business case phase uh, in the Department of National Defense. So there's high interest by the federal government on not, on not only the defense side, but on the civilian side, too, to, to explore the P3 model. Um, okay, James. Let's uh, kick off by asking you a question. Um, I know that, and I, I've heard this many times, is um, we talk about some of the current challenges of management in the operations phase. Is one that I've often heard is the management of, of IT infrastructure and building systems infrastructure, which is in many ways based on IT systems um, as we go through this. And really, we're transitioning. We've got a group of general contractors who've built bricks and mortar, and now they're into being added to ask all these complicated, sophisticated IT systems into the building. So, so could I just have your thoughts on that? So. Sure, thanks, John. So yeah, I, I referenced the, the CSE example, and we think it, it's one of the largest, most sophisticated data centers in, in the country. That, that's, that's their core business, right? So, so what's interesting, and in, in using that project as an example, you know, the, like the operating phase, if we think about it, right, that is the critical phase of these projects, right? Everything, procurement, construction, everything, it's all good, and it's gotta be done right. But in the end, the proof comes in whether or not you've delivered a facility that's performing to expectations and basically allowing you to achieve your, your mission critical operations, right? So as I said, we're, we're into the third year in that project. And um, you know, it, I get, what, what's important for organizations, and I think CSC partnered with us has done this well, I believe, but it's that cultural shift you have to have, right? To, suddenly you're no longer the master or in control of all of the things that you always traditionally did. You're now relying on your private partner to do that for you, right? So, so you, you know, if, if, if you were down to something as simple as HVAC systems, you're not going weekly to check the valves and the controls anymore. You're, you're checking is the air conditioning system working well and you're relying on somebody else to do it. So, so in, in, in going into the operating phase, that cultural shift is, is, is absolutely key. And, and in particular, it was CSE's example, right? It's, it's one thing to say I've got my facility and all my support stuff now in somebody else's hands so I can focus on my core business. Well, the IT systems at CSE are their core business. So now they're relying on a partner to keep those running and working closely uh, hand in hand with them. So, uh, you know, I, I think it, it's like all, all the things that are essential to the success of, of any deal, you know, that with good communication, good collaboration and focus on, on what are your KPIs and, and what's important. And, and in our case, we're only three years into it. We've, we, we hold more than just annual meetings, but big annual partnering sessions where we bring all the players together. But it, through our governance structure, you know, we have regular meetings at all the different levels that deal with 
with, with performance reports, issues that come up. So dealing with them quickly and addressing them and good communication, I think, is key. But you take the KPIs, for example. We, we started with a project that had over 300 very technical KPIs. And quickly we learned going into the operating phase. When I say we, I mean hand in hand. At, we're, we're the contract manager. CSE is the, is the user, the client here. So together we realized, you know, the, the KPIs are all important, but, you, but you, you quickly realize which ones are really essential to that core mission operational mandate you're trying to achieve. So we've revisited those, we've prioritized those to focus on the stuff that really supports the, the core operation. So I think, John, that, that's, that's what's key to ensuring the, meeting the challenges of, say, the operating phase and ensuring the success of, you know, what's really necessary to achieve your mission and mandate. That's what counts. Okay, so l let me just take something you said there and pose a question to John, which is, you know, uh, James needs comfort and his government needs comfort that uh, they can focus on their core business and count on you for the reliability of the systems. Um, tell us a bit more about why we should be confident with Johnson Controls and the systems you put in to these different buildings. In fact, I believe you're actually on the CSE. No, and no we're not only actually. Only if you mentioning it, <laughs> okay. so I have to. Right. Not one so, of the 31. Okay, okay. so <laughs> like, Plenary Properties Concessionaire, yeah, Honeywell okay. and HP. Okay, I know uh, that you're PCL on. Constructor, okay, let me so. switch gears a bit then. Okay. But I know that you are on the, uh, on the, uh, the data center that we have Absolutely. in Ontario. So um, tell us about why we can sleep at night and not have to worry about it because Johnson Controls is on the job. Well, I think twofold. I think, I think before we get a turn to the operational phase, and, and maybe challenging back a little bit on IT as a whole, I, I will tell you that it is, it is an area as an operator, I wouldn't say we struggle, but we've had to put a lot of focus on it. In fact, we just made a strategic decision that we needed a whole department to, to manage this as part of the broader P3s. But before we get there, I mean, one thing we have to work hard on is Yes, we can get comfortable coming up with a plan to keep those systems available for you to use, and, and that we can get our head around. But I still think we need the appropriate risk transfers. I think in some of the ones that we saw, we saw some ideas about prescribed life cycle. You know, there was a contract that came out and said, you should change the cabling every five years. And we said, <laughs> well, that's great. I'll make a lot of money, but it makes no sense whatsoever. That cable's going to last 30 years, so let's, let, let's not make that a risk transfer. Let's talk about how we can put that effort towards the system. And actually, uh, John, and what running. kind of disruption? I remember the project because I yeah. was on it, too. We won't mention which one it was. But what would be the disruption if you had to go in from a construction perspective, rip out all this cable and put new cable in? Well, first of all, we probably would have had to put a total redundant system in because how could we replace the system that's up and running and active? We couldn't have. So is there value for money to build it twice? Probably not. I think the, the strategies around spare parts and having a life cycle actual plan. And the interesting thing with IT, um, I say this a lot about life cycle. One thing's for sure, our plan's not right. I mean, technology just moves too fast. And... We've also seen some language in the contracts specific to this that would say something in minds that when it is time to life cycle, we'll life cycle with current technology. But just think about that. What does that look like? You know, the iPhone 8 just came out. Did everybody think about that four years ago and what exactly that would look like? And it cost $1,300 or something like that. And, you know, original phones is probably three, $400. Yeah. So it's a risk that we have to be careful about and try to understand what's the real intent of that, that clause in the contract and, and is there value in that in cases where there's not, make sure we, we take the, the process, we build out that operational phase that usually happens in the bid phase, if you like it or not. That's when you're making the plan, that's when you're creating those budgets. So I think it has to be a dialogue in, like a lot of things operational, I think it's important for both public and private sector to remain flexible. Because one thing is for sure, it is going to change and the plan we have today may not be suitable for those changes. So, while I've just got you on the topic sure. of IT, like, um, what do you think about, I, I know I have my own views on this, but about the heavy reliance and the, and the faith people place in technology, uh, particularly information technology systems in places like hospitals. I mean, you know, it's one thing if I'm tapping away on my computer and the system goes down. I know, you know, our own internal desktop systems go down and you can't send an email. It's no big deal. 
But what if you are uh, dependent upon the IT system for patient, or sorry, uh, a staff security at a facility, or you could be lying on an operating table getting a open heart surgery and uh, the IT systems go down. It's one thing, I understand on the electricity side, they've got backup generators, but IT, a lot of this stuff is brand new and we haven't really tested it yet, so. Well, I, I think you can get a comfort level with it. I think it comes back to the risk transfer and, and who's responsible for what part of that system. But the, um, it, it does, as I just mentioned, comes back to planning it out. And, and I think how, how we approach this and how we make the plan really comes down from the project agreement itself. I, I don't think as penalties, as a revenue, which I'll probably talk more about mm -hmm. later, but it's really there to create alignment. So when we understand what's crucial and what's important, it's our obligation to make sure we build something that we can have sort of that type of uptime, not that similar from our data center, which is a tier four operating center. It's as important to some people as well. But you can, I think, build plans and, and accept this type of risk. Um, but it is driven, you know, and, and as you're writing these contracts and thinking about moving forward with them, it is driven by alignment. So we look at what, what does a contract say is most important, then what do we have to build, what spare parts, what redundancy do we have to do there, then we can get comfortable with it and realize that we'll probably stay out of the situation where we're yeah. taking penalties. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to add on the technology front, and of course, IT is not necessarily part of every P3 deal, right? So I guess depending on whether you've, you've got the courage to bring it in or whatever, but the opportunities to say innovate are probably greatest if IT is part of it. Otherwise, other systems, environmental controls, everything. But, but I, I think, you know, you, you asked about how important in the reliance. So technology today, of course, is the enabler of everything we're doing, right? I, I was at a conference last week speaking with some engineering computer science students at University of Ottawa. And, you know, it was interesting. You know, they all walk into the room thinking, do I, I really want to work at either Google, Apple, you know, that's their list of companies. And the presenters at this conference were from companies like Sun Life Insurance, NASDAQ, Stock Exchange, talking about how they're using technology. And, and I, I thought it was great, because the students can see, you know, in the end, there's the sexy names that they all know about, but the reality is all businesses today are making significant investments in how technology can be an edge to success. So I think it's a given, it has to be there. But when you look at, say, our 30-year deal, say, on CSC with the IT, so we just have to look at what were computer rooms like 30 years ago. I, I, I was just working then and saw those rooms versus today and then try and imagine then over the next 30 years as we life cycle what is basically a defined performance spec and capability. But even the rooms we created in the CSE facility with all the backups and the air systems and the power requirements you know, in, 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 in less than 30 years, is that all gonna be running on a watch? Like, and then do you need those big rooms or do you just fill them with a, a whole bunch more smart watches? Okay. So, I don't know. We gotta give Sean yeah, a chance I, to get yeah, in. I, so, yeah, I, yeah. I, just, I just wanna maybe add, and I'm, I'm encouraged to hear that uh, people like Johnson Controls and the service uh, side of the business are investing in resources in-house. Um, I, like I like to say that I think if you went to some of our service providers and said, we have a, a facility this big, this many square feet, how many technicians do you need to run the boiler room? And they could do the math in their head and give you an answer in about five minutes. And you say to them, how many people do you need to run your infrastructure, uh, your IT structure, uh, infrastructure in the building, and they'll go, well, we'll have to get back to you and talk to a sub. Yeah. And I think that the, the, the industry needs to evolve and continue to grow in that area because we need our service providers to have that same, same level of expertise and comfort and knowledge um, in maintaining these systems, but also being at the table when they're being designed so that you're comfortable that you can maintain them and provide the service for the 30 years. Yeah, I think that's important. Jay, can we just, sorry, let's move on a second here. I want to give Sean a chance. Uh, let's talk about um, energy matters, Sean, and some of the challenges and opportunities around those. I mean, we could spend all day talking about IT, and it's an, it's an mm. important thing, but we'll never get on to other stuff, so. So sure, I'll thank you, you, John. Um, I, I've spent a, a lot of my career in working in, in gain share models in the tr what I'll call the traditional outsourced facility management uh, service industry. And the, the structure in those contracts is, is not as complex as it is in these P3 models, but we made it work. You know, there wasn't the, the greatest sub-metering in place and, and, and the contract documentation that would guide us on how to calculate, you know, the impact of weather, but we, but we made it work. And, um, when I came on board here, um, I've spent some time with my team and our energy team looking at the way we've 
put together our project agreements in Energy Matters, and, and we spent some time analyzing, you know, the progress. Are, are we having success with this? And there have been some bumps in the road, and, and you know, there's some, been some disagreements with the industry on how we calculate things, but generally speaking, overall, we're very pleased that it's working. It's incenting the right behaviors. It's incenting the right behavior in the design uh, uh, phase, but in the operations phase as well. So we're really encouraged by what we're seeing, and uh, why I'm, I'm, in, I'm particularly encouraged by that is with the McDonald Block project, our Queen's Park redevelopment project, uh, we have a very ambitious greenhouse gas reduction target on that, very ambitious. It's out there on the street right now in, in, in the RFQ stage. Um, and in order for us to, to meet that target, um, it was one of the enablers for us to, to bring the M into that project. It was originally a DBF. Uh, working with John and, our, and our, our internal teams, you know, we took another look at that project and, and we're pleased to see that, that we could get the funding to bring the M into that, so it's a full DBFM. Um, and outside of the ancillary benefits that will come for that, from that on the life cycle, um, it will enable us to achieve that ambitious greenhouse gas you know, emissions target. And, and I think for me, uh, this is, and in this industry, the P3 industry and this, this conference here, really what it's about is taking the, our models to the next level. And I think this is a project where we're going to be looking to the industry. I'm very confident the industry will be able to do this, but we'll be able to take the DBFM model to the, to the next level in terms of um, talking about you know, what innovation brings and the uh, behavior that uh, incentives that are put in place in these, in these agreements by achieving that, uh, by achieving yeah, that target. Yeah, I think you know, that's an important point, Sean. Like, I remember we were in, uh, when we were talking to Minister Shirelli about it, and we were discussing with him about you know, moving to a DBFM, and he, said, he challenged us, he said, you know, we're out there talking about DBFMs for hospitals and other infrastructure and courthouses. Shouldn't we show leadership as the province for our own flagship building and also do it as a DBFM. And when Sean and I talk about it, really, you know, a lot, of, a lot of designers will tell you we can design a building to be energy efficient. Builders will say we can build it to be energy efficient, but uh, nobody's around there to actually, you know, manage and maintain it to actually see it through that it actually performs. And the only way you can do that is a DBFM model where you don't give them all the money up front and then you can withhold it if the building doesn't perform. You know, and if you do the pieces separately, you, your designer will say, well, the contractor didn't really build it the way I told him to build it. And the contractor will say, well, you know, what the designer gave me wasn't really buildable. And so you got to put all the pieces together, you know, uh, make sure nothing falls through the cracks. And I think, you know, we're really looking forward to having this uh, new, and in fact, I think the, um, the RFQ, I think, closed last week mm -hmm. on this. Yeah. So we're looking forward to get on and getting the RFP out the door and actually meeting those greenhouse gas reduction targets and achieving the environmental policy goals of the province yeah. at the same time. So anyway, I should probably stalk them. <laughs> we, we're speaking to each yeah, other. Yeah, we we think it's such a great idea. But, but um, what about, um, you know, John, give us some of the challenges you see on the energy matters front. So yeah, know, it's I, supposed to us just, you know, being cheerleaders here. So yeah, it, it's an important part. And, and I think it plays a big part in the net present value when you're making your decisions at all. But again, it's, it's, a, it's a risk that exists. And you've got to not only build it a certain way, but maintain it that way. But as you're talking, I thought about one of our clients has a saying, he said, I will only build what I can afford to maintain. And when he was talking about that, he was including energy. So you can go and you could build something to the greatest energy level, but if you don't put the effort to keep it there, it's not going to stay there. I mean, all you have to do, I mean, we, we have a, about a $700 million business, and all we do is run around fixing projects that were built by people 10 years ago that aren't energy efficient. And so it's a good business, but there's no reason you can't apply some of those concepts to, to it in the design phase. But I think the... Um, message I like to say from our operational side, and again, I think the contract is good. It incents us to continue to look for, for energy savings, but I think one flaw we have today is that it's usually based around consumption, which is a good thing to do in the construction phase. I mean, that, that's a fair test between designs. What's the consumption going to be of both buildings? But technology is changing. It's changing rapidly. Distributed energy storage is going to be a big thing, especially in, in this area where in Toronto because of global adjustment, there's some great revenue enhancements that the hospitals and others can get from these projects, but the contract, the way it exists today, doesn't change the consumption. So my message would be is remain flexible as the market changes around us. Let's sit down, talk together. We can adjust what we, have, what we were given with to start with based on some of these things that are maybe outside our control, but still take advantage of them because you can save real dollars, not just consumption. Okay. 
Thanks, John. Um, Sean, let's go back to you again on the Queen's Park reconstruction mm -hmm. project, or as we call it internally, Mac Block. Um, and um, you're, you, you know, you've, you've got a multi-tenant. You've got all these ministries in there. You've got um, ministers' offices in there. Of course, trying to tell a minister's office they have to do something, you know, doesn't always usually go over very well. Um, in fact, because as far as they're concerned, we work for them, not the other way around. And so you're going to have a bunch of challenges here with all these tenants and the different tenants and strong-willed tenants. Tell us about, you know, what challenges you're going to face and how you're going to deal with them. Well, I, I see a couple challenges with this project. One of them really, I think, is independent somewhat of, of the AFP or P3 model. I think that really is we're moving 4,000 people out. We're actually in the process of doing that now. We're moving 4,000 people out. We're going to hand the building over to John. And... Um, then we're going to move 4,000 people back in. And under any type of model, that's going to be a challenge. So really, you know, that challenge is something we'll take up with our, with our service provider. Um, you know, we'll, we'll build some things into the contract to make sure that's obvious and evident in, in the, the type of, type of uh, service provider we want to see on the project. But ultimately, we'll work closely with them as we do on all transitions from construction into operation and make sure that goes as smoothly so as I possible. Just gotta, so I just got to tell you, I appreciated your comment earlier, you know, about, you know, Sean and I have this friendly back and forth because he's complained to me about I didn't properly finish off some of my buildings before I turned them over to him in the operations phase. And he's actually right. You know, sometimes the truth hurts. And I just wanted to tell if there's any contractor sitting in the audience there, we, there used to be a time in the past where we would, uh, we call it carve out or, or defer some of the scope of work that was in the main contract. We strongly advise against that anymore. Uh, we want fully commissioned buildings, fully working buildings, uh, that before we turn it over, otherwise I'm going to have Sean all over me about you know why I'm not doing my so, yeah. doing, doing yeah. my part of the job to to give him something that works from his perspective. Yeah. You know, you, first of all, it's hard to get the contractor back in to finish the work once you're into operations phase, and and secondly, um, you know, it's uh, uh, you'll always have these operational problems as well that you don't need to deal with when people are actually trying to deliver the service they're supposed to. Sorry, that's a really good point, you. John. And I think you know, it goes back to this project. This, this project is, is very unique in, 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 in the fact that there are 15 ministries. It's primarily an office facility. It's, it's very different than all of the other DBFMs we've done within the general real estate portfolio and even within the, 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 the broader um, portfolio we have with the hospitals. Um, it's 15 ministries, it's, it's, it's offices. The other uh, projects we've done are, are courthouses and detention centers and hospitals, and they're usually you know, a single tenant, a single organization that you're interfacing with, and really they're, they're special use. And, and a lot of the payment mechanism has been set up you know, uh, based on the importance of availability, um, tying you know, the life cycle and maintenance together to availability. Of course, that will be important. Availability will be important within this facility, but I think there will be a, an even greater emphasis on, on service and quality. So that's something we'll be looking at in our, in our documentation is on this project, should we maybe shift the balance in the payment towards service and quality and a little less on availability? We'll be taking a look at that. Okay. Maybe, James, I can go back to you on um, um, just to talk about, um, you know, what kind of problems or deficiencies, are there things that have been, that have been kind of lingered on that you've, I know we've had challenges at Infrastructure Ontario with those kind of issues. Are you seeing those kinds of things on your P3 projects or, you know, they, you know, most of them work okay, but then you've got some where we just can't seem to fix problems and they go on and on, so. Yeah. Well, you know, again, we've got an experienced set of two, right? Both projects have gone very well, but I think some of those issues are common even in other forms of deliveries of, of, of major capital infrastructure projects, right? So I, I think what's key is that you have to address the deficiencies very quickly during the construction and commissioning phase, right? And, and, and we've been able to achieve that so that we, we've hit SCD targets. And, and some, in some cases, you know, we'll, we might revisit and redefine SCD a little bit just to take some maybe tail end construction-related um, items to be completed, but say they don't really impact the operational capabilities, so we'll shift them out a little bit. So, so you, you have to have some flexibility, I think, that way. But, but for the most part, I think it's just about managing your contract well, working well in, in, in partnership, and then addressing them very quickly and getting them done. So part of our internal discipline on any type of project delivery is we don't let issues drag on and become you know, things that, because we all know that 
the, the longer you take to solve it, the less the interest and parties are moving on. So, so we just don't let that get there. What about uh, John? Would you like to say anything about this? Yeah, I think it's a, an important topic. And I think um, hitting substantial completion shouldn't be a milestone. It's a mm. major event. And it sometimes doesn't get the, the attention it deserves. You can imagine we, you know, we start off, we set out a plan. We, get, we have a plan. We think this is what it looks like on day one of operations. Then you find out day one of operations has 200 construction people on it. And we've got to try to manage it. And we're getting measured and tested on delivering the operations with all this extra work going on. And um, we've even, through our experience, evolved that right into warranty management as well. It's sort of a different part of the operating phase that has to be treated a little bit differently. Um, our experience, for the most part, has been good. But I think the most important part, if there is some kind of substantial completion agreement, that it's got to be fully understood by both parties because sometimes they're rushed, everybody's under pressure to get to those daylines, and there's some assumptions can be made by either side. Sorting out those assumptions later on is extremely difficult. So I think it needs the time it deserves when we decide to go substantial with that punch list still outstanding. Yeah. Can you tell us, like, John, when you enter into one of these contracts, what do you, what do, you do to make sure, like, obviously, we say in construction that the cranes and machinery and equipment don't build infrastructure, people build infrastructure. It's all about the people. And so what's your advice in terms of building the right relationship, you know, to make sure that the, oper that the, the transition from construction to operation works smoothly? Obviously, I have to do my bit on my side. But also then, what do you do to make sure it keeps running smoothly and making sure everybody's on the same page and has the right expectations? I think it. It has to do with uh, the relationship, and primarily you're making a lot of these decisions when you're bidding the project. And you know the comment about you know you know can you, uh, you know, are the general contractors do they go away? Well, of course they do. They they want to close off their books and say we're complete and everybody's happy, but it doesn't necessarily work that way. I mentioned Abbotsford earlier. We had our contractor back last year in fixing some things that were unforeseen, and we went to them and talked to them about them. So our, our approach to do it is obviously we, we, we are at, the I mean, I'll never forget the first projects we did. We'd show up at a design meeting. People say, what are you doing here? <laughs> so, well, we're gonna, we've got to run the place. We yeah. have to be here. And it yeah. took a while for them to accept that. And engineers yeah. look at us saying, well, maybe we should look at doing that differently. They look at us with two heads. So, well, what are you yeah. talking about? Yeah. But I, I will tell you, we've come a long way since then. So now, uh, thankfully, we're, we're, we're invited to that table. Mm -hmm. And not just um, to, to bring a benefit to it, because I say some of these energy facts, we can bring a lot of value to some of those decisions by running NPV you know, categories. And for those who know some of the details of the project, you know, um, guess what? Low cost construction doesn't, al doesn't always win the job. Yeah. You know, we, we can mm -hmm. have operational savings make up for that higher cost, mm -hmm. and it can provide that, that value. So I think it's key to be at the table and then also, we, we typically um, would have an interface agreement with that general yeah. contractor, so they understand what our obligations are and what the impact on their decisions are to obligations. Yeah. I, I think overall, that's worked out very well for us. Yeah. I find it discouraging when I hear. Sorry, I just want to. I well, find ahead, it discouraging John. when I hear, and I, you know, they're older stories. But when you have to be invited to the table or push your way into the table, because my expectation is you're absolutely at the table, and any of the operators out there, or service delivery organizations in the business, it's my expectation that you're absolutely at the yeah. table, not only in the design phase, but during, obviously, the deficiency stage, the yeah, commissioning and deficiency all the way through, because they are going to hook up their yeah. trucks to those trailers and pull out and move to yeah. the next project. That's, yeah. that's their job, but we, yeah. we need to work as an a, com a combined team yeah. to make sure that we, okay. we get through the, the deficiency yeah. stage. Absolutely. James? And John, just as quickly, I, I just wanted to reinforce what they're saying. So I, I mentioned these partnering sessions we hold annually, so we've already had three on a three-year O&M deal, right? So we start with, you know, strong messages about what are our overall goals and objectives here, and then we move into roles and responsibilities, right? I think that's the key part. And, and when you think, you know, we've got 30, 25, 30 year life cycle deals, but we know the same people won't be there for that full time, right? Yeah. So as new people come into the management and involvement in the deal, do they really understand what you all agreed to just a couple of years back and what you're trying to achieve? So we start with that, even at, like we have 50 plus people at full day sessions on these, right? So everybody, all the partners are, are involved there, right? Uh, this year, you know, we did a, a survey of all of the participants well in advance to really gauge 
not only how well they thought things were going, where were issues, how could we work better together. So we built the session off of that, and, and it was really effective. And, and you know, I, I've attended the last three years. Maybe I won't keep going for 30. I won't be around there anyway. But, but I find it useful just to get reinforced what we're all focused on and get us all on the same page. And that's part of the tremendous success we've had, I think. I, I just add, I, I'm going to uh, steal a line from actually one of John's folks, because I sat in one of those port partnering sessions as well for one of our facilities. And I thought it was really well said is that we were doing introductions. And, and uh, the gentleman um, said, you know, that these partnering sessions are about but maintaining the relationship. I'm in the maintenance business, and this is maintaining the relationship. And I thought that was really apropos, and, yeah. and you do need to maintain the relationship as oh, you do the key. equipment of the building. Mm -hmm. well said. Um, John, just uh, you briefly mentioned talking about um, the contractor's going to finish, and their truck's going to pull out, and they're going to leave. So that kind of leads us to another issue, which is um, oftentimes over a 30-year relationship on these contracts, um, we have provisions in our contracts, I know, to allow equity to change hands. And, um, you know, for, there could be some very good reasons. It's because if you're a contractor, you want to redeploy your equity into another project and you're not really in the maintenance business or whatever it is. Anyway, um, this is really directed to, to you, Sean. How do we know that the public sector is going to get treated fairly in these types of arrangements when equity does change hands? Well, there's a lot of provisions in the contract, obviously, the guide that process, John, and I've facilitated a number of those um, uh, equity uh, sale and transfers um, that haven't participated directly, but our, our transaction finance group, our transaction legal group at IO has managed a couple in our portfolio. We've helped a number of hospitals as well as the MTO on, on a highway recently. So the expertise is with, within our organization and uh, it, we're, we're only a call away, so we're absolutely happy to make sure that it's uh, yeah. done fair and equitably and, and that the taxpayers are are getting uh, best value. Yeah, and just for, if there's any uh, hospitals or others who we've helped outside of the, um, the uh, Infrastructure Ontario, the service is, uh, is free, um, and it's uh, Divya Shah uh, is our SVP of Transaction Finance, and she would be happy to help you if you get any of those requests. Um, maybe now I think it's time to switch to uh, some of the questions we've got. Um, coming up on the infrastructure, um, I'm sorry, that are coming up in the panel that uh, people are sending in. So, um, so the first one, geez, it looks like a hard question. <laughs> it's a lot. How will you coordinate with the Federal Infrastructure Bank? So I'm tempted to be mean and pass with some over to James because he's from the federal government. <laughs> yeah. No, I, don't, I, I wouldn't be fair. Um, well, Hang on, we've got another one here. Let's defer that one for now. That's the easiest way. Well, well John, just, Why, you know what we could do is we could ask uh, the chair when she gets up to speak later today. Yeah. Um, okay, let's hear. Some, some criticisms of the DBFM model include that the financing by private sector increases the cost of projects, adds time and complexity to the transaction, and makes project variations cumbersome and costly during the operating period. While financing also brings discipline and governance, recently Ontario were exploring a DBF plus M model, but it did not materialize. Does the panel have views on whether there is a future for DBF plus M or DBM slash DBOM models? And if so, under what kind of governance? So, um, I don't know, Sean, do you want to? Well, the, the DB. I can help you with this. Sure, one, I'll, I'll jump in first with the DBF. Uh, plus M is something that we explored in Ontario, um, and, uh, it, and to make it clear, uh, the DBFM uh, model itself is not going anywhere. We're a believer in that. It's a cornerstone of our, yeah. uh, of our approach. This was really designed to, how can we take the DBF model, um, which is in, in, in projects that are really designed to be and intended to be a DBF, how can we add a maintenance component to that so that we can have some of the benefits of that, and there was tremendous debate um, in Infrastructure Ontario on that model. Um, we looked at it for the McDonald Block project. It wasn't the right project at the right time, um, and I think it's something that we'll continue to explore, and again, it'll be on D uh, projects that are deemed to be DBF, and is there some way we can add a maintenance component of that and some of the benefits to it? So stay tuned, and we'll be continuing to look at yeah, it. Yeah, and, and, and I remember, because Sean and I were in there for many of those mm -hmm. meetings that we had on that, and. And so you're asking yourself, why would we rebuild this 
beautiful complex. And actually, for those of you who don't know, the McDonald Block is actually a heritage building. It's one of my architects was exploring it. And, and if you go closely and look at the, the stone on the outside, you will see little fossils on it. Um, the limestone you know, came from areas up around Wyerton. There are many uh, Ontario-based materials that were used to build that. It's actually quite a fascinating building. Having this young architect tell me that this is the most fantastic building, I never kind of thought of it from that perspective. But just getting back to the, the DBF plus M, we started asking ourselves, well, we're going to build it, and then are we just going to let it deteriorate again, or are we going to try and do something to keep it in good shape? And as the minister said, show leadership on this. And, and when we started asking ourselves about the M, the, we, we said, really the power to maintain something is the ability to withhold money mm -hmm. when people don't perform. And so it wasn't clear to us if you disconnected the F from the M part, the plus M part, that you would have that leverage to be able to make those things happen properly. And maybe um, I can ask you, John, for, because we went out and we did market soundings. We talked to, I'm sure we talked to you guys, John, we talked to contractors, and we had a lot of pushback from some of the contractors who said this doesn't make sense. And so, John, you must have some views on this. Yeah, I, I do, and they're biased. I'll admit it up front. <laughs> but um, I think it is a value proposition, without a doubt. What we just talked about is being at the table. Um, and, and I like to think, you know, when you break it down, we always talk about the consortiums, our bidding projects. But ultimately, when we get to, to get to that phase, we're often the owner's rep. I mean, we have an expertise that we could bring to the table. They build one building every so often, and we're involved with this on a regular basis. So there's certainly some value we can bring to that table. And we are seeing some different models, but I think the biggest downside would be, ultimately, if you do a DBF, you're, you're likely going to go for a low bid, and that's who's going to win the contract. Now, we can, we can price and maintain any of the three buildings that, that get... Uh, get designed, but they're all going to have obviously very different costs, very different life cycle uh, budgets with it as well. And it's kind of interesting that even in jurisdictions that are responsible that don't have the legislation to do P3s, they're starting to see contractors use this as a tool to differentiate themselves. The new buzzword I heard recently was called outcome-based construction. And so what they're trying to sell to their clients mm -hmm. is we're going to make sure what we build will perform the way we said we're going to build it. And so they're trying to leverage and trying to create models where they don't have the legislation to do it because even the contractors themselves know this is a way where I can add value as opposed to sitting down and value engineering a building which ultimately takes out a lot of the good stuff. Yeah. Okay, I so... Can, I can add another perspective sure. okay. on that if you like. So, yeah. so, you know, from our client partners' perspectives, right, it's you, you look at the sort of key maintenance requirements. So D&D &D has targets for the amount of spending it wants to do to maintain its facilities, right? And I mentioned massive portfolio, 40,000 plus separate pieces of infrastructure, right? So the question comes out, you know, how do you want to invest your money? And we'd all say, absolutely, you want to maintain your facilities. We have a huge combination of newer and very old facilities, right? Some everybody would agree should be replaced, but then the, it's not an unlimited pot of funds, right? So, so we do a lot of maintenance type contracts for the right type of facilities, and our client partners have to decide what, what's key to supporting their operational requirements and, and what isn't. And they also want to maintain some in-house capability, because even when we're deploying Canadian forces, you need to have skills that can meet all those needs, right? We don't deploy contractors. That's done yeah. by the forces. The last aspect I want to mention, it's, a, it's an interesting part of, if you're looking at a given facility, you would say, we just built this beautiful facility, let's maintain it. But think of it in terms of management of a massive real property portfolio, right? As you identify projects that get the committed funds either through a P3 model or FM or whatever for the maintenance, right? What happens to the rest of, of, of the assets that you're having to maintain? And, and what I'm getting at is in any limited budget scenario, right? There are times when you have to adjust, and often maintenance and repair is an area that's hit. I'm not saying that's a good thing, right? And it doesn't mean you go to zero, but maybe instead of hitting your target of 1.4% spend on realty asset value, you know, you take it down to 1% temporarily. But, but, but what ends up happening is the assets that were lucky enough to get picked for these types of models, 
right? You can't vary the spending there. Johnson Controls still has to get paid. So you start borrowing even more from all the other infrastructure. So then you really have to decide, you know, what is the best approach here? You can't just favor some over the other. So that's the holistic view on management. And that's one of the challenges in, in trying to make the right decisions on what form of procurement model to use. So John, I, I, I want to add something to that. And, and I applaud McDonald Block Project. Uh, for those who've heard me speak before, I think um, the value that a lot of people in this room can come to existing buildings. Design retrofit finance maintain. As you said, not every building should be replaced or totally done. Mm. And we see, well, we, you'll see them uh, building operations. People try to tackle this sort of one PO at a time. I'll do a little bit of energy. I'll do a little bit mm. here. And then their budget gets cut and they can't do it. So I would, I would encourage um, you guys to continue to look at that. And not even where you have to take all people out. A lot of times we can fix the basement and the roof and we can yeah. accomplish a lot yeah. uh, to, to increase and make the building a more useful building and perhaps take away the deferred maintenance that's just piling up. So there's a lot yeah. of value in this. I applaud the McDonald yeah. block. Okay. Well, let's uh, look at another question here. So, and um, I think uh, here, let's hear the, the payment mechanism and deductions regime leaves some significant room for interpretation. How aggressive should private proponents expect procuring authorities to be in applying deductions over a 20 to 30 year contract? So, Sean, I think that's a good one for you. Well, so, you know, one of the things we did recently was we changed our payment mechanism. Uh, when it applies to system failures, and it goes back to the discussion we had at the beginning of this, this, this session. Um, and the, one of the reasons we did that was to make, make sure it's very clear to everybody who's bidding, you know, what our expectations are in terms of designing and what the potential um, deductions would be if there's a failure in system. So in that case, it, it, we did that for a reason, so that you know you're getting yourself into, you know, cost it out, design it right, and, and, and anticipate if something goes wrong, this is what the penalties would be very clear. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, my, my position on that is it applies to, to, to the rest of the PayMech. Um, when we have, right now we're dealing with some elevator failures and it's early, early days on these contracts. And I think that for us it's about, you know, maintaining the balance and of, of transfer risk. If, if, we're, if we're giving relief or having liberal interpretations of the PayMech, um, taxpayers maybe aren't going to be getting the benefit that they should be getting on the transfer risk. So yeah. I guess, you know, we want to sit down, we want to understand, we work together. It's important that we have the relationships and we, we understand uh, how we calculate deductions. Um, but my sense is it's, it's important that we have as much discussion as possible at the beginning uh, so that, that, that the private sector can uh, understand their risk and, and price that in properly. Yeah. And John, do you have a view on that? Yeah, th th this is, this is uh, an important topic, you know, and, and we were talking about comparing types of buildings, and I'd say that, uh, you know, the majority of the times of uh, 22 existing sites and operations today, that at any given time, 20 of them are going quite well. And so yeah, I'm not going to suggest that, the, that it's broken, but I also know that there is no perfect contract, and we can try to think through all the things that are going to happen, but I'll assure you that, that uh, things are going to come up that we'll try to put into some section of the contract, and we go, hmm, we're a little unclear, or if it's gray. If it's gray, you're definitely going to get two opinions. So I think it's um, important to, to communicate these things, and and use the process. I mean, a lot of people think dispute resolution is a really bad word, mm. but it doesn't necessarily need to be. It, it provides clarity because we need to understand the rules of the game. And if I have one idea of how that's going to work and you have a different idea and we approach that, so I'm trying to, like I said, it drives behavior. So I'm behaving in such a way to try to avoid something that may not be important to you whatsoever. So we think it's, we've got we to gotta look at these on an ongoing basis and are they right or have they changed along the way? And I, th I think, you know, we talk a lot about driving behavior, and it goes both sides. I mean, if, if, if a client wants to, yeah. and we have a couple that have tried this, they'll, they'll, they'll look at payback as a revenue stream. Yeah. They'll say, well, I'm just going to hire somebody, and all they're going to do is walk around and try to find issues with your system and what you're doing, and then we're going to be able to deduct penalties from you, and therefore, I don't want... Do we, do we really believe that, though? Like, I find it hard to believe people are looking at the payback as a revenue stream. Like... I think what they really want, they just want their building to be functioning properly the way they, they expect it to be. And the one thing I say to clients is, you know what, if you're going about to take on 
this project company or Johnson Controls, whoever it is, and deduct money, just be absolutely sure yourself that you've got all your facts straight. Because if you don't and, mm. and you're in a weak position, they're going to fight back. And, and so, I don't know, like I'm... So I, I qualified by saying that at any given time, 20 are working quite well, yeah. and that's what happens there. Yeah. When you break down that communication yeah. and you start seeing behavior in... Um, basically, you got to remember these contracts. They take the money first, we talk about it second. And so, you know, we self report and they say, we know, we don't think that's right. They come up with a different deduction. Now we're not paid. We, we can't stop work, we can't do nothing, so we've got to go and have that discussion. Was it calculate, right? Sometimes it's a math problem. Oh, it's as simple as that. Somebody made a mathematical error, it's fixed and we move on. But sometimes it does come to interpretation of what that meant, systems that you talked about. You know, if, you're, if your Wi-Fi is down, is your whole hospital down? And so therefore it's a total unavailability payment, which costs us you know, $400,000 probably a day yeah. Yeah. To, to do that. So you just have to understand what the rules of this game are, know what they are, and if they're not working for either party, don't just sit there and say, well, penalty, penalty, penalty to get your attention. Sit down, find a solution to the problem. And if, if it means going back and suggesting amendments to the contract that, that correct the behavior, then that's the approach I'd rather take. Yeah. And, well, again, and, and, and that's what I talked about earlier in terms of revisiting the KPIs that yes. we had. So, so and it, we all know it's very tough to amend a PA formally, right? But I think the, the, the understanding of the parties for applying the ones that really matter. So in our case, any KPI that's supporting the mission critical operation, we absolutely would levy the penalty. And, but, and, and we've been successful because, there, for example, CSE has never had an interruption in the availability of the IT system operation, which would, is critical for national security. On the other hand, you know, we had KPIs that said, you know, every Monday morning you must deliver this report, you know, by 8 a.m. or whatever. So if, if that report that really is not that critical and nobody even really looks at it in the first place unless there was a big problem, was 10 minutes late, should we levy a penalty? So we've pulled back and said, no, that doesn't make sense. So I think, but, but that has to be a constant process, right, of revisiting. And so we, we intend to make KPI review, you know, a, a top priority so, al always in the relationship. Sometimes we almost laugh when we get the original KPIs. You know, thou shalt answer the phone in two rings. Mm -hmm. How many rings did it used to be before you, you had a P3 model? Exactly. Or, or you look at, um, you know, you have to show up in five minutes and it takes you 25 minutes to cross the campus. Like, yeah. you have to, what, what do you want us to do? Put somebody, so I think it's important yeah. to, okay. to make realistic KPIs that, that are manageable. Yeah. Otherwise, you're, you're paying for something you don't really need. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's uh, go to another question here. Um, so what is the plan to help municipalities who lack an infrastructure in Ontario procure and manage critical social infrastructure on a P3 basis? Um, I don't know, maybe I'll start this one off. It's less of an operations phase and more of a general uh, advisory phase. Um, you know, our CEO at Infrastructure Ontario, Aaron Corey, often likes to say, one of our corporate objectives is to grow your impact. So, and his view is that if the infrastructure is critical or important for Ontario's well-being, then he's happy to um, get into a relationship with the municipality um, to help them. And so I think uh, the, ch the challenge for us at Infrastructure Ontario is that, and we do, help, we do work with municipalities. Um, we're currently uh, talking to um, the... Uh, um, the City of Toronto about the George Street revitalization project. Um, this is a question that was also asked by um, Michael Fenn in his report that he published recently. Um, you know, we worked with Ottawa on the light rail transit. Um, and what I find though most of the time is a lot of municipalities don't want our help, but we're willing to help if you, if you do want us to. The one thing we would ask though is that we have certain ways that we want to approach business and and we kind of view our approach as a holistic approach. And so if you want to change stuff, it doesn't always work for us. And so we, we kind of, we want to set a, uh, some ground rules before we do get involved. And then, and then, and then we want to follow those ground rules. We're not going to help or put our name or our brand on something that, that you know, is really substantially different from what we had originally tr anticipated. Maybe, Sean, do you have anything to add to yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, in the operations phase, we've invested in developing, you know, a whole set of training tools, and process procedures, training documents, um, 
to help our, our hospital clients kind of transition from construction through to operations, and, and we're there to help them out. We've taken that, those same training documents, and in fact, John just mentioned, we've been out to the city of Ottawa. In fact, I've been there twice uh, with our transaction finance, transaction legal teams to, to uh, present that training to them and those tools. So, yeah, we're, we're there to help, and it is part, as, as John said, is part of our overall mandate, one of our goals to, uh, to continue to help the municipalities. Okay, I've got another question John, here. Can I, can I just add, oh, sorry, yeah, I, sorry. I, I just want to give a big shout out to IO for recognizing that there's transit issues other than just in the GTA. So thank you, <laughs> thank you for helping us get our next yeah. fall launch on time on budget, right? So. Um, you know, and we're working on other projects in Ottawa too. We're working on a hospital out in Hawkesbury, the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. Good. Uh, and uh, actually one of the fun things about any infra infrastructure Ontario is you get to go out all across the province and do stuff. And, and I, I have to say, even though I live in Toronto now, um, some of the people who appreciate you the most are people from very remote parts of Ontario. And you know, yeah, some like of the, Ottawa. You know, we built a courthouse in Thunder Bay, not in Ottawa, <laughs> forget it. Like, um, the Thunder Bay, uh, North Bay Hospital, Sudbury. And if you do well and you deliver what you say you're gonna deliver, they'll appreciate it for, for life. And of course, other, the initial reaction to you is, oh, you're from Toronto, right? But, yeah. but actually, uh, I'm from a small town too. I think most of us come from somewhere else, and so it is good to help them. John, so maybe of interest that um, I, I mentioned our, our U.S. pipeline. I, I think probably 30, 40 percent of that is municipality. Um, we've got two projects so far. The deals sometimes are a little bit different. You know, we've done some recent market sounding actually here in Ontario with some of the business consultants, and they tend to. Um, be two projects, one more of a real estate deal. So if I give you land, can that help generate? But you take after the public builder. So it's an emerging model, but we've got two in the States now. And based on the market soundings they see today, and I assure you they're, they're looking at your models when they're trying to make these decisions. Um, okay, so we have another question here. Related to the previous payment question, IO only actively manages a few projects in operations across which Project Co welcomes the consistency and application of the, pro the contract. Maybe, Sean, I think this is one for you, and you can talk about what your group is doing in terms of trying to bring consistency across the broader Yeah, you know, a couple of things. I mean, I just spoke to it. We've developed some training packages. There, were, there was originally some manuals that done about a generation ago, and we've taken those kind of to the, to the next level. And, and so we've got a consistent training package that we can share with our hospital clients. and. Um, and, and we remain on the ground. Um, in fact, we're sitting in most of the FMC committee meetings with the hospitals um, and supporting the ministry and some municipalities. So we're on the ground um, and we are committed to supporting the model we've put forward and we're, we're in the process right now of trying to formalize an arrangement with the Ministry of Health so that we'll remain um, as advisors on the hospital projects for the long term. Okay, so we probably got time for one or two more questions. There's one here. Um, there is an increasing level of risk transfer to the private sector and punitive recourse, particularly on service providers. While the focus on cost reduction and operating margins is exa exacerbated by the low net present value cost. Um, not sure we can see the whole question there, but um, um, Sean, is that ringing a bell with you or, or John? Um, I'll pass it over to John because he's obviously closer and he's pricing these things out. But I, yeah. you know, I have to say, some some days I feel that um, the service providers are alone on these, and, and it really is a consortium that we're looking to on these projects. Um, you know, you don't want to, you know, decades later bring back the the, the, the construction provider, but we look to Project Co to play a leadership role um, along with the service providers um, and the lenders, if necessary, as as the consortium to to make sure that the transfer risk is is held within the consortium itself. Well, I'm not sure about the statement being punitive. Um, it is if it's important. Like I said, I, th I think the, the contract should be built in such a way to do, to do I'm sorry, but to um, drive behavior. So how are you going to behave at operating phase? And so you kind of make the rules no different than your demerit points on your license. They don't want you to speed. If you speed, you get caught. You're going to, you're going to pay the fines. So I think understanding the rules are, are, are key, but um, if they are punitive, you just need to know that the, the operations people are going to have to price it. And, you know, it may, it, I think I'm thinking one project was very punitive where they said there's no time to, or to, to repair it. The penalty starts the day it breaks. Well, then you would say, okay, we can do that, but we have to build a redundant system. 
If that's value for money, then that's the way you should do it. But if it's not, then I think you should revisit and say, you know what, maybe it's okay for four hours before it has to come up. And you compare that to the standards you have today and see if that makes sense. Okay. Um, folks, I think we're going to have to wrap up here. So I'd like to thank my panelists for uh, all your thoughts and insights on this. And uh, if we can just give them a round of applause here.